I'm Vince Cox, your committee chair, and I represent Pinellas County. We'll go clockwise around the room, starting with Richard Bennett to introduce himself. Uh, my name is Richard Bennett, and I am uh, representing the beach communities. Good morning, everyone. I'm Dan Seracki, council member for the city of Oldsmar. Uh, Jeff Gow, Commissioner, representing Dunedin, delightfully different. <laughs> the city or you? Do you, do you, do you yeah, good? that was both of us. Yeah, okay. the city and me. Uh, Josh Schulman, uh, City of St. Petersburg. And you're Ryan Miller, representing the greatest transit system ever. <laughs> yeah. The SCA. We heard that the other day, didn't we? <laughs> yeah, the MLK parade. Okay, now is the time for public comment. Are there any members of the public who wish to speak? Okay, and now let's go to our action items. Um, I'll move that the November 17th meetings be approved. Second. Minutes. Okay, that's the meeting minutes for the 17th. All in favor say aye. 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 Motion passes. Next we have Henry. Kasich and Al Burns, Director of Procurement. <clears throat> Henry is the Director of Maintenance. And we'll outline our first action item and it's regarding bus filters. Henry? All right, All right. good morning. Uh, for those that have been on the committee for a while, you've probably seen this a time or two. So everyone knows the key to good maintenance is changing your fluids and filters. And we do that religiously here. Uh, in the maintenance department. Um, because we have 200 plus buses that range from model year 2005, soon to be replaced, all the way up to brand new buses, 2021s, we have a lot of different filters for a lot of different components, 29 different sizes and shapes to be exact. Um, now, Director Burns is going to step up and talk to you about the procurement process, but as you can see in your packet, there's several vendors uh, to award contracts to, and that is really because Al and his department have shopped around for the best possible price for all these different filters. Um, so take it away, Mr. Burns. Thank you so much, Henry. Good morning, Mr. Chair. Al Burns, you're highly motivated. I'm Procurement Director, and Happy New Year. Glad to be back. Um, this action item here this morning, <clears throat> we sent out a, we, we went, and the procurement method we use it for this is invitation for bid. And what that stands for, uh, what that means to the average person, it means that the bottom line price that we receive. So we had over, I want to say over 50 stock, 50 um, line items on this. And for every vendor that submitted, we looked and made sure that there was the lowest price along with meeting um, Henry's um, requirement. Also, I'm extremely pleased about this procurement because PSTA, we did this as a joint procurement with our partners across the Bay Heart and PSTA and my team um, led that procurement. We released the solicitation in, in mid-November in compliance with PSTA's policies and procedures. We posted it on our website and we also posted it on Demandstar. In mid-December, we received six bids, and that's a lot of competition, and I want to commend my staff for going out there and drumming up the competition. However, one vendor, Neo Park um, Transit, was determined to be non-responsive. The reason they were determined, they're, they're a vendor that we're currently doing business with, and they already have a contract with us, but there's certain rules in public procurement and certain documents that you must return. And, they, and the document that they did not return was the representations and certifications, and therefore they were deemed non-responsive. I have talked to Neopart, and, they, and they're fully aware of that, and we'll continue to do business with them, and there's other opportunities in the future <clears throat> that they learn from their mistakes and they'll bid on, on future opportunities. Um, we did a responsibility check with all the vendors. We're already currently doing a business with the majority of them, and all of them are, are in good standing. In, in your packet, you'll see a table that shows fleet products, um, Gillick, Kirk's Automotive, the aftermarket parts company, LLC, and vehicle maintenance program. Vehicle maintenance program. Yes, that is their official company name. 
The fiscal impact of this, this item has been budgeted, this, this item is budgeted for and is part of the FY22 approved budget. The recommendation is pretty lengthy. Recommend approval of a one-year contract with four one-year options with Fleef products for a total contract amount not to exceed $264,000. Gillick LLC for a, for a total contract amount not to exceed $46,000. Kirk's Automotive Inc. for a total contract amount not to exceed $29,000. The aftermarket, the aftermarket Parts Company, LLC, for a total contract amount not to exceed $25,500. Vehicle Maintenance Program for a total contract amount not to exceed $398,000. And authorize our CEO to exercise the four one-year options. I would like to add that I asked, my, I asked the team to vet with the companies the availability of these filters, and they do have those filters in stock um, currently, so we're gonna be placing orders um, if, if it is approved by the, um, the board. If there's any questions, Henry and I would be more than happy to answer them. Jeff? Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, yeah, these are one-year contracts with four one-year options. So it's basically five years. Is this a, a normal process? This isn't something new. We saw this five years ago. We'll see it in five years. Y yes, sir. We, we, um, the old contract, I believe it was for... Um, five years. The reason we the reason we split it up in the options the way we did was because it gives us the flexibility depending on what the market does. If the market goes goes below goes down, and the cost we see the costs are coming. Um, staff every time we bring a recommendation um, to to um, to exercise an option, we have to do an analysis to make sure the current um, the pricing matches current market conditions. So I asked my team to split it up into one-year base with four one-year options. Just, just in case the pricing go, goes down and we'll, we'll terminate or we won't exercise the option and we can go back out to market. Right. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Any more, any more questions or comments? <clears throat> All right. So do we have a motion to approve? So move. I'll yeah. move that the uh, PSTA <laughs> Approve the transit bus filters. Second. We have a sec a motion and a second by Mr. Gallo. Okay. All in favor say aye. 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 Thank you, gentlemen. A lot of filters. We got filters. Yeah. <laughs> okay, next we'll have we'll hear from um, Ross Silvers and Al Burns again about our travel training services. <clears throat> Good morning, Ross. Good morning, Mr. Cox. Thank you, everyone, for having us here today to talk about travel training. Now, let's see, I think we have the main slide on the screen. I believe we do, excellent. All right, so travel training, this is a uh, uh, contract we do not currently have in place. I'm really excited that we're able to present it for you here today. <coughs> travel training is essentially kind of the, the art and science of being able to work with seniors and persons with disabilities and others who need some assistance in figuring out how to safely and independently use our great accessible PSTA bus system. And so kind of for that process, we've been preparing for this. We actually have grant dollars that we have been set aside for this that we've been accumulating uh, so that we could be able to go out for procurement as we are doing now. And we actually have, as we've gone through our new access eligibility interview process, we've been identifying people, especially who have can conditions of eligibility, not full eligibility for our access service. And for those folks, we have put them on a list if we feel like they are good potential candidates to receive this training and be able to use the bus when they're not using it now. And this is really important because the reason why so many uh, transit agencies have taken on travel training as a program is not only is it a great thing for our customers, but it's wonderful for PSTA's budget. So for every person who we can migrate off of the access service uh, for even one trip every week is gonna save PSTA thousands of dollars just for that one person. So it's very rewarding work. It's challenging work, but it's very rewarding uh, to see those accomplishments. And of course, for the individual rider, it gives them great independence, more flexibility than they have with access. 
And of course, they're in a more inclusive environment with, with everyone else who's out there riding the buses. So uh, it's really a win-win. It's a win for the customer. It's more affordable for them. Uh, PSDA gets to take the savings of them riding the bus over access that we have on our end and reinvest that and making the services even better. Uh, and uh, we're real excited that uh, uh, we have a great uh, company who's, who's ready to go on this. Al, you want to tell us about it? Thank you, Ross. Thank you, Ross. I'm Mr. Chair Al Burns, Director of Procurement. Um, I'm really excited about this procurement. Uh, there's a couple reasons where you, uh, you leave private sector and you come into the public service and you can see the benefit of how it affects the community and this is one of those. Um, this was a difficult procurement. Um, not so much in the scope of work and things, but being able to find competition. A little bit of background, we went out twice <coughs> for this and the last time we were successful and I helped my team garner, um, garner competition we received one, one proposal. Um, the company that you see um, that we're bringing to action, Alfred Benish and Company, they, um, they acquired a company that we've been doing business with for a very long time. And the name of that company is Tyndall Oliver, and they're, they're on some of our general services or A&E contracts, architect and engineering contracts, just to give a little bit of context. So it's a, it's a, it's a great vendor. And now I'd like to walk you through a little bit of the procurement process. In October, we released the RFP, once again, in accordance with all of our policies and procedures. And in December, we received one proposal, and that was from, uh, I want to say Tyndall Oliver, I have to kind of get used to it, Alfred Benish. Um, we received one proposal from them. Um, even though we received only one proposal, we still evaluated that proposal to make sure that it met all of our requirements, i.e. the scope, um, all the deliverables, Meaning, how, how are they going to be able, be able to accomplish the work that Mr. Ross um, has spoke to you all about? So we wanted to make sure that we vetted that. One of the major um, stumbling blocks was that their initial proposal was for over $670,000. $678,000. And I was like, okay. And Ross and the team, we, got, we huddled up. And we, we decided and we created a negotiation or a discussion strategy on how to lower that cost. A lot of the initial items that they that they presented to us were things that were that were nice, but we just didn't didn't think they brought value. And once again, we wanted to bring it down to that um, budgeted amount. And like Ross said, the, um, all of this is federally funded. All this program right here is federally funded. It's not coming out of reserves or anything like that is from um, one of the grants that we get. Sorry, Mitch. Um, in January 6th, we entered into negotiations, and I'm pleased to let you know, Mr. Chair, we reduced that uh, initial amount down by 51% to the dollar amount of 344,000 that we're bringing to you um, this morning. Even though we've done business with Tyndall Oliver, we still did a responsibility check on Alfred Benish because of the dollar amount and I'm pleased to let you know that they are qualified and ready to do business with us. There was a DBE um, participation in this as a DBELO. They did have DBE participation, and that was for some of the outreach initiatives. But in order to get, in, in order to reduce the price, we ended up eliminating the DBE um, in order to get us down to that 51 along with some other things. So it was one of those that we had to do. The fiscal impact of this is Federal Transit Administration grant funds. In the recommendation that we bring before you this morning is recommend approval of a three-year contract with two one-year options with Alfred Benish and Company for a total contract amount not to exceed $345,000 and authorize the CEO to exercise the two one-year options. Um, in your packet, there is a table that, explain, that, that you can see exactly what we're going to be getting every year, and I would, and the thing that I thought was most interesting was the first year is the most is the most we're going to pay, and then after that, then everything kind of flattens off, flat um, excuse me, levels out. Um, if there's any questions, Ross or I would be more than happy to answer them. Thank you, gentlemen, and um, Mr. Schulman. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, so looking at the the chart that you referenced, um, there are some items here that are crossed off with a zero uh, cost, and then there are some items that are not crossed off with a zero cost. 
So are the ones that are not crossed off, are we getting those and we're just not paying for them? Correct. So like the develop outreach plan has no cost, but they're still gonna be doing that? That is correct, sir. Okay, Absolutely. just wanna make sure I understood that. And, and ultimately the goal here is for this group to train PSTA employees to do the outreach or are they gonna be doing the outreach themselves? I, um, I believe they're gonna be developing it for us and transferring it over, but I'll let Ross. Yes, correct. So essentially they're gonna be doing uh, kind of core travel training services, which is they're gonna be developing an outreach plan, developing a travel training curriculum and program, and then they'll be actually delivering that with the people from that list we developed and refer to them. So it's gonna be us kind of directing their activities and saying, okay, go work with uh, John Smith, who's an access rider and lives close enough to a bus stop that he can use it. And then they'll provide us with written documentation, here's the success or whatever, and we can measure that uh, for accountability. And they will also do some train, the, some train the trainer, but not so much with us, more with outside agencies, so they can work with their clients and train them as they come through the program. So thank you for that explanation. Um, did we, um, in the presentation it said that there was uh, 150 um, access riders currently that we've identified as being candidates for tr mm -hmm. the training to uh, switch uh, mo mobility. Um, sure. Is there a limit to the number of people to be trained in a year? You know, it's, it's really hard to quantify in terms of people because one person can take just one <coughs> session and they're like, oh, okay, I got it now, I'm good. And someone else may take five sessions or more before they are able to figure out, okay, here's what I need to do and do it consistently uh, to get to work every day on the bus. Right, so but in this contract, are we gonna get to a point where they say, okay, you've met, we're, we're not training anybody else this year, we gotta wait till next year. There, yeah. there is no minimum and there is no maximum. Okay, so they're comfortable with the data that we provided and their own experience doing this to say, we know what we're getting into. Um, the, the last question I have, if, if I may, Chair, sure, sure. is, um, uh, around staffing um, for this. Are we confident in this environment and or do we have any built-in um, obligations on their side to, um, that'll make sure that we, they have the staffing um, to, to actually do this? And, and, and that's an excellent question and that's one that Brad challenged us with um, earlier, excuse me, last week. Uh, there are provisions in the contract that if someone gets ill or something like that, that they have to replace that person. However, they just can't pick anyone off the street and say, okay, this is your body. Every contract that we have, if someone wants to replace someone, they have to um, bring, us the, bring us their resume and we have to say yes and we have to mutually agree upon that. We just can't put another body in that, in that position. So in um, seeing that through, if we can't find anyone who, who fits that bill, are we still obligated to pay under the contract? No, I, I mean, yeah. right, that's, you, that's, said, you that's said there was no question. minimum. There was no minimum. There's no maximum. So, um, well, if, if well, if I can just speak candid, um, if if you don't have the staff, I'm not going to pay you for a job that you're. We're not. We're not going to pay you for work that you're not performing. I mean, at the end of the day, so we would. There's there's procedures in our in our contract that we would follow. For example, giving them a cure notice, saying, "Hey, you need to fill this body," and if you can't. Um, then we would look at different alternatives, either terminating the contract, going back out. But we, we've done business with this company a long time. Um, they're doing, they're providing this service to Sarasota. So I imagine that if that were to happen, they would probably have the Sarasota staff help us out until they're able to fill that position. That would be my. I, I appreciate that. None of this is a comment about the company specifically. Yes, it's really just the environment we're in and knowing how, uh, how difficult it is to uh, obtain workers. Yeah, the nice thing about it is it's really something that can be a part-time job for like a healthy retiree or something. And it's where they don't have to be here at PSTA in an office. And as you know, everybody wants to work not in an office environment. So this is where they can work you know, on their own, basically coordinating hours with a person, meet up at a bus stop, and you know, take the bus rides together. So it's, it's really nice flexibility uh, for someone who wants to do this. So it's just finding that right there. Sure they will. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Commissioner May. Mr. Gao. Uh, thank you. Uh, and just kind of to, to follow up on, on the employee concept, who, and, and this might be for the C students, and you might have already explained this, um, but, but where's the, who, where is the follow up? Where does that lay? Does it lay with PSTA or does it lay with this agency for 
the employee not getting there on time, making sure that uh, the, the results are satisfactory? Sure, it's, it's joint, but I, as the person who's gonna be the project manager for this, I'm gonna the one who is taking responsibility for making sure of the quality and the responsibility of the work that's being done. Uh, so I'm gonna be following up with individuals who are scheduled to receive the services and be travel trained and be talking to them about it. So as soon as I get those reports in of, okay, they wanna bill us for so many hours of travel training and here's the results, I'm gonna be contacting that person and say, hey Sam, how'd it go? Tell me about it. And making sure that we're getting what we're paying for and, and it's being done a, in a quality way that has meaningful results for us. If I can also add, um, Commissioner Dow, <clears throat> once again, those are, ch those are challenging questions that Brad asked us. How are we gonna be able to manage that? How are we gonna be able to, to do this? In, in the scope of work or the contract, there are set deliverables that they, have to, that they have to meet, the reports that Ross talked about. All those are things that are in the contract. And Alfred Benish, um, they're our architect and engineering firm, and they're used to meeting these deliverables. And, and there are things that Ross spoke about that are gonna be able to be measurable through the course of the contract. And uh, you had mentioned there is a train the trainer component to this. And this is a, a five-year contract, and so I'm wondering what that train the trainer looks like in year one versus year five. I mean, if, if we can't train them in five years, you, I'm, you know, I'm just wondering the length of the contract versus the, the concept of train the trainer. Sure, and that's part of why um, it's a little higher cost in year one, because year one is a lot of development work. So it's putting together the train the trainer curriculum but it's not for them to train us, it's for the person who's gonna be performing the work under this contract to go out with the different agencies, whether it's vocational rehabilitation or it's a, um, you know, other folks who are trying to help people find jobs or it's working with the school system, but helping to train people who are working with others who could be riding our buses and have disabilities, for example, or be seniors that they can be able to impart the knowledge and the skills that the travel trainer is working with people on one-on-one. -on -one. So it kind of spreads that knowledge out exponentially. Additionally, additionally the purchase cost is $8,447, whatever the curriculum that uh, Ross spoke about, and there isn't any more cost associated with that throughout the rest of the duration of the contract. Yeah. Yeah. And so with that train the trainer concept, are we anticipating not meeting a year six or year seven that these agencies, given turnover and labor issues, uh, that, that this would be something that we could pass on to those agencies and then they would do the work? Excellent question. Um, I'm not sure if the contract has piggyback language in it or not. I know Brad has um, been wanting me to put that in there, so I'm confident that we probably have it in there. Additionally, FTA has certain rules on the length of contract and the term that you can have with a contract. And um, I think last year we brought to you a, a big robust paratransit service contract that we did a, our first 10 year contract because there's a lot of capital risk that a company has to do. But in a contract typically like this, you normally do it with a two or three year base with one two year option. So that's the reason that we gave it this term for this length of contract. One, because of the rules from the FTA, and two, it just, it just kind of fits them all in. It's not a big dollar amount. And usually when we do train the trainer, we're gonna train more than one person at each agency, so mm -hmm. it can kind of live on and be properly used by each agency. Okay. And my last question is, and I don't wanna micromanage the contract, I wanna try and keep this at a 30,000 foot level, but it talks about, um, right, and each year the numbers decrease in some of those, but I noticed that every year there's a, a, a kickoff and that dollar amount didn't change. And I would think that because there's no minimum or maximum that contractually there's year one, year two, but as far as the program is concerned, it just kind of keeps going. And so I'm wondering what that kickoff element looks like in year two, three, four. Really what it is is that it's like a you know, like at PS today, like we have our, um, our performance measures. So it's really, it's a chance for us to kind of meet with them and look at the performance goals that are in the contract and to say, okay, where are we? What are we needing? You know, where do we need to go from here? 
how do we keep growing this so it keeps having the results that we want? Because things keep changing. And at PSTA, you know, we're always taking on new programs and new directions. And so it's to make sure it stays relevant and that they're kind of in tune with what we're up to and where we're headed. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Um, I, I have a question, gentlemen. Um, I'm looking at this uh, from the aspect of being a paratransit rider. And for example, once that individual has gone through this training and are able to ride the bus, but let's say a certain trip they take would require a connection. It would be a real long ride on a bus. Can they still use our, um, our access mobility? Yes, this is not a program to force people to have to use the bus when they don't want to or it's gonna be unsafe or unrealistic for them to do so. Okay. This is for the person who lives, you know, a block away from the bus, but they've never ridden it before. They're really nervous or their parents or guardians are really nervous for them. Uh, and they just need someone to go with them and to help them overcome those fears and to give them the skills so they know how to get on their cell phone and see the trip happening and, and learn, you know, all the things that we do all the time when we ride the bus. Uh, but just because of their disability, um, you know, I'm thinking such as somebody with an intellectual disability, for example, they just need that extra time, that extra effort, so they get that comfort level up. Thank you, Ross, I understand. And now also this will save them money too, based on- Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, okay, good. Very good, thank you. Any more, sure. Mr. Hipshulman? Yes, uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, just one uh, quick question. Um, there's um, individual and group travel training. Is the group travel training taking groups on the bus at, at a time or, or presenting two groups? It's both. Uh, you would typically have kind of a, a pre-trip portion that would be a group presentation, and then you'd actually have an on-the-road piece where the, you'd take the group out. Okay. I, I would like, um, just as a consideration from our end, um, that as the group travel training documentation is being created, that we keep an eye as to what, what materials um, that are there we might be able to use um, to present to Pinellas County Schools. Excellent. Right, we're going to have a lot of new groups that we could, we could be training. And so, it, you know, borrowing pieces that are being created in the one aspect that can be repurposed um, for, for other groups would be, I think, helpful. Yeah. Perfect. Thank Very you. Very good. Yeah. Travel department. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank and you. With, with that, I move approval. All right, we have a motion to approve our um, <coughs> contract with Alfred Benish, not to exceed $345,000. We have a motion, do we have a second? Second, second. I'll serve. Okay. <laughs> I'll give it to Richard. Flip a coin. Okay. Second from Mr. Bennett, motion by Mr. Shulman. All in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank, Thank you, you. Good job. All right. <laughs> Let's move on to the Sun Runner Project Management Construction Change Order, and we'll have Abhishek. <coughs> Good morning, Mr. Chair, Good morning. Uh, members of the Finance Committee. It's great to see you. Happy New Year to all of you. Uh, Abhishek Dayal, Director of Project Management, and uh, this item is for action, and it's to recommend approval of a contract modification uh, to HDR Inc for their project management, construction management services uh, to support the Sunrunner construction project. And it's for a not to exceed amount of $490,000. Next slide. Uh, next slide, please. So um, as you are familiar with this project, this is a 10 mile project uh, connecting downtown St. Petersburg uh, through South Pasadena and into St. Pete Beach. Before I get into the, the uh, main item, the action item, I just wanted to take this opportunity to just give you an update on the, on the project construction. You might have seen a lot of construction activity going on uh, out on First Avenue North and South and downtown. Uh, we're really excited about uh, all the progress we've made, so I just wanted to take that opportunity to just give you an update on where we are with this, with this project. Uh, next slide. So as you, as you know, we are, we are still the, the only agency in the Tampa Bay region to have successfully secured a Federal Transit Administration uh, New Starts grant uh, for a project of this magnitude. Uh, so the project cost is uh, approximately $44 million. 
with really successful partnerships, uh, not only from FTA, but also Florida Department of Transportation, City of St. Petersburg, uh, and of course our own uh, capital reserves. Next slide. Um, so overall, all station platforms now have been completed. There are 30 platforms that our contractor was supposed to construct. So all of them are, are now completed. There's still some ancillary work going around, uh, around those platforms, like the crosswalks, connection, connections to the sidewalks, those kind of things. That's still going on, but the, the, the platforms itself have now been completed, so really happy to report that uh, major milestone. Uh, we've also completed the restriping work on First Avenue North and South that was to make room for those platforms. <coughs> that has also been done. Um, we are working very diligently with Pinellas County and City of St. Petersburg's uh, traffic staff to uh, implement their, the traffic signal controller upgrades to allow for that signal priority. Uh, and then our contractors also working uh, very closely with our other vendors and partners on the technology piece of the, of the project, the ITS piece of the project. So I'll talk a little bit more about that. And then we also have a lot of coordination uh, with stakeholders on their local projects. And uh, the HDR team that's managing the construction of this uh, project, they are doing a lot of that coordination for us on our behalf with those different agencies that have their own construction projects going on along the corridor. Next slide. So um, as, as far as the station platforms, again, as I mentioned, all platforms have been completed. Uh, you can see some photos here, uh, most notably on the bottom right. Uh, some of you were at the event last month where we unveiled a fully completed uh, platform with the shelter and the totem and the blue handrails. Um, so, so a lot of that is done. What you see on the middle and on the left are what's typically been completed so far. So the platform has been completed. It's just the uh, work outside the platform that's still remaining and that's what our contractor is busy uh, working on. Next slide. And then as I said, the uh, roadway restriping work has also been uh, completed, which was a major undertaking on First Avenue North, First Avenue South. We had to close uh, a lane of traffic to be able to do that and our contractor working with the HDR team was able to uh, do that uh, quite successfully um, and um, being able to complete that work. Next slide. And then as far as the uh, ITS technology pieces, uh, traffic signal installation was a big part of, of this project. We in fact installed new traffic signals on 40th Street uh, where there weren't any uh, signals to allow for safe access to our platforms. So what you see here are some of that work We've also been uh, upgrading a lot of those traffic signals uh, along the corridor. And you can see some photos of that, that work uh, being done. That's the open uh, signal cabinet that you see on the, on the right, uh, right inside of the, of the slide. Next slide. And then, as I said, we have a lot of agencies along this corridor. We're coordinating with not only City of St. Petersburg, we're working with South Pasadena, St. Pete Beach, FDOT, Pinellas County, and many, many developers that have their own development projects along the corridor. Lots of cranes, lot of, lots of uh, orange cones to, to work around with, so the uh, HDR team, again, is working very diligently with all of those entities to accomplish this work. On the left side, uh, this photo is uh, from St. Pete Beach. That's their four sewer main project, which is uh, a really big undertaking in, in that community. So we worked really closely with their contractor so that we could go in and out, uh, complete our stations while they're still doing their uh, four sewer main project. Um, on the right is the uh, storm drain improvements that we actually performed on behalf of the city of St. Petersburg to minimize any disruption to, to the public. Um, so we actually performed this construction work. The city compensated us for this work, but our contractor since they were already out there in the field, we just did that work for the city, again, just so that could be all done all at once and not have to do it multiple times. Uh, next slide. 
So uh, as far as the construction uh, schedule uh, is concerned, this will continue on through summer. Uh, we are on the sort of the closing end of, uh, of this work, uh, including the testing and startup work, uh, particularly the testing of all the software and the technology pieces that the contractor is installing. Uh, we do anticipate the service operations to begin in late summer of 2022. Um, and then the contract closeout will be done uh, beyond the opening of the service. And you can kind of see the photos of uh, our HDR crew working hand in hand with our contractors uh, to make sure that all the construction work is going on to the specifications, it's tested, and, and it's, it's in line with what our designs call for. Uh, next slide. So just to give you uh, a quick uh, update on, on where we were from a couple of years ago, this was a, a sort of a contract awards chart that I had shared uh, back when we first started this project. If you click the next slide, these were all the contracts that we were going to award and Finance Committee, of course, awarded uh, many of those contracts. The uh, Lochner was the first contract that, that was awarded back in August. And they are the design team or the engineering team that completed the design for this project. Next slide. Um, HDR team, which is the, the action item today, they were awarded next uh, in September. And their role was to oversee the design uh, contractor, which is Lochner at that time. And then that would transition to construction once the design was completed. Next slide. And then in 2019, we agreed to use uh, the state contract to purchase uh, buses, nine buses, uh, through Gillig, and that was done in September of 2019. Next slide. And then finally, in 2020, right after we got the grant from Federal Transit Administration, uh, the Finance Committee and the Board uh, approved a contract with David Nelson Construction Company and that's who are doing the, the construction work. So this is just giving you kind of a, uh, on how this project is structured and organized. So HDR essentially manages those three, or I guess Lochner and Nelson contracts to oversee the design phase and then the construction phase uh, once we're in construction. Next slide. So um, as part of this work, as part of this contract, the HDR team is providing not only construction oversight or day-to-day -day construction work, but also they're doing materials testing. They're also doing field inspections. Uh, they provide full and part-time personnel for uh, construction oversight, including a full-time project administrator. We have a project controls person to look at the invoices uh, that are coming in. Um, field inspectors, uh, and you saw some photos from the, of, of the, our field inspectors, and then also a project scheduler to make sure that the project is uh, going as per schedule. And then as I mentioned, they are coordinating with the, uh, not only our team or other departments, but other stakeholder agencies, uh, including all the cities, DOT, Pinellas County, and then our Lochner team to make sure that the design, what was designed is what's being constructed and all that, uh, any questions by the contractor are answered by the engineer. Next slide. Um, as far as the construction activities are concerned, um, if you might recall, we had completed design in early part of 2020, and we were kind of in a holding pattern and waiting for Federal Transit Administration to allocate the funding, and so there was about a four month delay in when our design was completed and when we actually got the funding and we were able to start construction. So there was a little bit of a delay um, that, that we had to contend with. And then there were some additional delays because of all the construction items that were added to this uh, contractor's scope. Uh, I mentioned some of the work that we performed for the city of St. Petersburg to minimize uh, the construction, that, that did add some delay to the contractor. And that was something that uh, HDR team also worked uh, very closely with us as well as with the city. And then of course, as I said, the, the, there are other projects going on uh, along the corridor, uh, including the four sewer main project. Uh, FDOT has their project going on. Uh, Pinellas County had, had to lay, out, lay down fiber along Gulf Boulevard, so coordinating with them. So that also added some time uh, to the contractor's uh, general timeline. And that's, that's why it's, it's causing a little bit of a delay 
from what we had anticipated back in 2020 when we first awarded the contract. But I will say thanks to HDR's really diligent efforts and working with the contractor, we were able to reduce some of those impacts that a lot of agencies around the country are seeing with regards to supply chain uh, issues. With acquisition of materials, acquisition of some of those key components, the HDR team has been working very closely with, with the contractor on, on doing that. So I just wanted to mention that here. Uh, next slide. So in the end, we are recommending an amendment to HDR's contract uh, for project management and construction management activities for a not to exceed amount of $490,000. Um, what that means is their current contract value is about $2.8 million. And we, if we add 490,000, that changes the contract value to 3.3 million. I should also note that this is completely included in the project budget. Uh, we are not changing the project budget, still $43.9 million. Uh, I'm not asking for any funding from Debbie uh, at all, so this is all covered as part of our contingency that FTA requires us to maintain. So I'm really glad that we were able to use some of that contingency to offset some of the changes that were frankly out of our hands uh, because of the, the weight and some of the other construction projects uh, around the around the area. Um, so with that, I'm, I'm happy to take any uh, questions from the committee. Thank you. Thank you so much, Avishad. Commissioner Shulman. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Avishak. Um, it's always great to see a, um, an update on the Sunrunner. Um, and I appreciate your first, your last comment was my first question, which is where are we within our contingency? So um, I'm glad to hear that we're within that contingency level. Do you know how much we have left? As far as uh, if this contract gets approved, how much we have left in the contingency budget? I don't have that exact number. I'm happy to give that to you. Okay. Uh, but we we will still have a fairly uh, healthy contingency left over even after using this. So we're still confident based on what we see coming down the road and the plan as it's laid out that will still be well within uh, the budget that was set. I'm very confident. Okay. Um, the the second question I had was um, you know part of our delay. Um, was due to, as you said, coordination with other cities, other construction projects, um, things that we did on behalf of other um, organizations. Uh, were we compensated at all? Um, not just for the work that we did, but for the time delay that it took. In, 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 right, so for paying part of this contract because now we're taking on an extra expense because we coordinated or delayed with another uh, project team. Right? So we were compensated for the HDR's time, that extra time that they're now doing uh, with the contractor. Of course, the contractor was compensated for that extra work, but then the contract management side of things, we were also compensated by the city for that work. Right? Okay, so in essence, what you're saying is we've received some amount of revenue in to cover our responsibilities under HDR's prior existing contracts so that even though we're, we're extending the contract, part of that money is coming ostensibly from other 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 uh, municipalities that we're supporting. That's correct, yes. We did build in a small portion uh, that we are billing to the, the city for that for that uh, additional work. And I'm, I don't imagine you have that number with you. I do um, not. Uh, I mean, we, we generally use a, a thumb rule which is what we did for HDR's contract back when we had first awarded this contract, that it, the construction oversight is about seven to eight percent of the total work, the value of the work, and that's what we are billing to the city for that for that oversight. Okay, so we're using the same ratio basically, exactly. and then that was built into uh, the other projects. Yes. Okay, thank you. It's all good. All right, we good? Yep. All right. Gentlemen, do we have a motion to recommend? Mr. Chair, I'll make a motion to approve the Sunrunner Project Management Construction Management Contract Change Order. Okay, we have a motion. Do we have a second? I'll support the motion. Okay, we have a motion and a second from Mr. Bennett. All in favor say aye. 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 What, just one quick comment, Mr. Chair. Nope. I have a check. I've been on this committee since the beginning, and I just wanted to tell you, you're doing a fantastic job. This is going to be a great project for Pinellas County. Thank you for all your hard work. Thank you, thank you so much. Mr. Chair? Yes, if I may. You uh, may. Uh, just, a, just a question, how, um, 
based on um, community response. Have, uh, do you have any sense or do we have any data on how um, maybe the community is responding to both the construction project or you know, how things are going? You know, we've been getting emails, phone calls, those sorts of things. Yeah, and I'm, I'm happy to give that to you. We are, I know our outreach team does track how many comments we get, uh, especially on our construction website. Um, you know, on a, on a weekly basis, they do compile some of that reporting, so I'm, I'm happy to provide that to you. Okay. Generally, we do get uh, the same concerns on, you know, how, how long is the construction going <coughs> to be? Uh, is there going to be impacts to the access to my business or Will there be uh, lanes uh, blocked off for extended period of time? So we respond to those comments as soon as we get them, just so folks uh, know and understand what types of construction they might anticipate or they might expect. Uh, another thing that we've done very successfully, uh, again, with our outreach team's assistance, is walking down the corridor before construction began and actually talking to the businesses, adjacent businesses, and the re residents and neighborhoods, just so they are aware of the construction that's about to happen. Uh, so that way there are no surprises also when, when our construction crew does come and you know, tear up the roadway or the sidewalk. So that, that part is, uh, is already being done. Okay, thank you. That's all. All right, that's all. thank you so much, Abhishek. Okay, we'll go to information items now. And I see here Michael Hansen and Al Burns will take us through the Flamingo Contract <coughs> Services update. Michael is on Zoom. Michael is on Zoom. All right. Al is here in person, highly motivated, coming to the microphone. <laughs> Who's going to start here? Go for it, Michael. Michael. Good morning, Chair and Committee members. My name is Michael Hansen. I'm the Director of Financial Planning and Analysis, and I represent PSD as one of the project managers in the region uh, for the Flamingo Fares project. By now, many of you are very familiar with the Flamingo Fares system, and many of you have had a chance to, to get a Flamingo card or download the application, and we thank you for doing that and trying the system out. Today, I'm going to give you a little brief update on the Flamingo Fares project. After a brief review of the Flamingo program, I'm going to pass the presentation over to Al Burns, our pro procurement director, who is going to go over the contracts with Enit we have been negotiating because next month we are going to be bringing back related items back to you for your approval. Next slide, please. So in summary, Flamingo Fares is a regional account-based smart card and mobile payment application fare system. Our customers can add value to either their smart cards or mobile application account and use that stored value to pay for their bus fares throughout the region. Regional agencies, which are part of the region-wide system, are the Hillsborough Regional Transit Authority, which has been the lead agency on this project, the Pinellas Suncoast Transit Authority, as well as Hernando County Transit. Next slide, please. So we have had several recent accomplishments for the Flamingo Fares project. In July of 2021, we began distributing smart cards to our customers. During the months of July and August, customers were able to pick up free smart cards from any of our transit outlets or also had the option to download and use the mobile application. During this period, customers who participated in this launch of the program were able to ride free in our system. In September 2021, we began to collect fare revenue through the Flamingo Fare system. The public adoption rate thus far, especially in Pinellas County, has far exceeded our expectations. As you can see in the, in the Flamingo ridership growth graph, uh, PSD rides through Flamingo had totaled almost 1.7 million rides through November 2021. Since we began collecting fares through Flamingo from September through December 2021, almost 900,000 fare paying rides have been taken in which PSD has collected revenues of approximately $690,000. And we think this has been a fantastic start and launch of the system. Next, my colleague Al Burns is going to tell you a little about negotiations that have been occurring within it, the vendor for this project regarding the continued operations and costs of the Flamingo Fair system. Thank you, Michael. Um, good morning again, uh, Mr. Chair and uh, committee members. Um, in it, uh, Brad always catches me off guard. What does that stand for? I, and, I, and I forgot, but one of the things I can tell you <laughs> is that they are a German company. Um, they're, they're headquarters out of Germany. 
and they're one of the leaders in um, fair collection systems in, in the um, transit um, arena, not only here in America, but from a global perspective. So um, Duncan Shane to that company and, and that good stuff. Um, the implementation it has been completed, and now it's time that we've been negotiating the maintenance and the license agreements. We have several. We have Clever. We have um, Giro. Ah. Um, all the different software packages that we use, and all of them, we have similar agreements like we have with the, um, within it. Um, and this is specifically for the um, license and licensing and maintenance. Um, we started off with we started off with um, at 1.3 million, and kind of looking over at Debbie, and we were only able to get it down um, approximately a hundred thousand dollars. Um, through um, discussions slash negotiations. Um, Michael and I, we did not do this alone. We did not do it in a vacuum. We had all the major stakeholders um, at the table and providing us feedback. Cassandra in the planning department, um, Julie Cagliostro uh, from IT, and Henry from operations in the transportation group. So collectively, yes, um, we've, we um, consulted with them on different areas as it pertains to those different um, different departments. The things we negotiated was we negotiated the hardware warranty, CDS hosting cent um, systems, I did write that down. That stands for central data systems, basically um, the cloud service, mobile ticketing system, open payments, um, daily operations and monitoring. And that was one of those areas that Brad um, stressed that he wanted to see the value in that. And we have a detail, there's a lot of detail behind exactly what we're gonna be getting for that. Um, I'm pleased to let you know that these funds are budgeted in our 2022 operating budget. Um, and the cost is sustainable. This is something that Debbie and Michael, Michael also being not only the project manager, but he's in charge of the budget. Um, they say that these costs are sustainable. Um, and we're anticipating out of this $1.2 million, we're anticipating to um, probably have to take on half of that because it's pretty much as you saw three age three agencies I, I'll say it's two major agencies and that's part in um, PST and of course um, with that I'll turn it back over to Michael thank you Al next slide please so what are the next steps we'll be taking to enhance the Flamingo program first and foremost our next major milestone will be working on planning for a robust retail network that incorporates Flamingo fares we had been working on a board approved retail network for Flamingo Fares, but due to cost increases proposed by the vendor over and above contracted agreed upon rates, we along with Hart and the region decided to move in a different direction. Currently, we are still selling magnetic, magnetic straight passes to our retailers such as Amscot and CVS as we have for many years. In the coming months, we're planning working on transitioning those sales to Flamingo Fair products in the future by using our own staff to build a retail network. Another major milestone that will be implemented this summer will be open payments. Uh, this is a payment solution that will allow our eFair re readers to also accept payments through contactless credit cards and smartphone devices through the use of smartphone payment solutions such as Apple Pay and Google Pay. Next month, we will bring to you an action item to approve participation in HART's Init License and Maintenance Agreements. And with that, um, Al or I would be happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you, Michael. And thank, <clears throat> pardon me. Thank you, Al. And do we have Mr. Shulman? <laughs> thank you. I feel like I'm carrying the question. No, come on. Just, um, so, ask the question. Um, huge fan of Flamingo. Thank you for the work that you're doing there. Um, as far as looking ahead, um, is there any thoughts or work around a U Pass or C Pass integration into Flamingo? Um, so as opposed to like, for uh, for example, hotels that are part of the C-Pass, uh, you, showing their key, you know, being able to uh, um, have that on the app as, as marking someone as being a, um, a guest, or the U-Pass, like Pinellas County Schools, instead of showing their ID, they're, they're able to use the, the um, Flamingo Fairs. Yes, part of the Flamingo Fair program is um, something termed, uh, it's called institutional programs. 
So we will be working on, on migrating those programs eventually to the, to the institutional side of Flamingo Fairs so that those, those people uh, and the CPS and the UPASS programs will be able to use the Flamingo program as well. Okay, thank you. And um, one of the questions when it comes to uh, um, the, especially the, the UPASS in Pinellas County Schools, um, and, and I'd asked the question before, um, is there gonna be an, an ability for um, parents or other users to uh, link up with existing Flamingo Fairs uh, accounts? So for example, if my child had a Flamingo Fairs account for their school that I could log in and see their activity um, under a master account. Um, you, you, you can have multiple um, cards under one account. Okay. Um, so you could add their, their card under, under, the, under, under a, a main account, yes. Okay, thank you. That was a, that was a question that came up from, uh, from other parents as well as far as you know, tracking um, when and where their kids are getting on and off, uh, or on in particular, um, the, the bus and being able to use Flamingo Fairs in that way. So I appreciate that. Uh, no additional questions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. One question, Mr. Chair. Sure. Mr. Chair. <clears throat> the other payment options, the credit card and the smartphone devices, is there gonna be an extra cost for us for the contract? Will it be added on or is this gonna be included in the current contract? That, that, um, is, okay. that is a line item that's in the, that we've been negotiating and that price is included. Okay, good. That's it, Mr. Chair, thank you. Okay, I have a question. <clears throat> I have a question. Um, I used the Flamingo a month or two ago to take the trolley, the Central Avenue trolley from Grand Central just down to the pier and I was, normal fare is 50 cents for that for a regular uh, passenger and a quarter for a senior. But I hit my card and I was charged $2.50 for that. Um, do we, thank you. yeah, <laughs> come on, I want my, give me two bucks, Fred. And, um, you broke the bank. Yeah. No, the, the bottom line, I mean, if I were, <clears throat> you know, I, I wouldn't be happy with that if I'm paying for this and I'm it's supposed to be 50 cents. And, yeah. I'm getting two dollars and fifty cents hit on my card. Are we doing anything to differentiate these fares uh, with the flamingo card? Can anybody answer that for me? Um, I can start to answer it, and I think Cassandra Borchers can answer that. The flamingo system, as it's currently designed, cannot doesn't have like a geo. Um, geography thing that it can recognize that you're in downtown St. Petersburg and so going to the pier in that fair free zone that we have a deal with the city of St. Petersburg on, um, it doesn't recognize that. And thanks to you and others uh, who told us mm -hmm. that they were being charged full price, we, I think we've changed it, Cassandra can answer that, I think we've changed the policy so that right, right now at least it's just no, no charge. You don't, you don't have to even, um, tap your card at all okay. so that people are not overpaying. Is that right, Cassandra, uh, in that fair free zone in St. Petersburg, or what's the deal on that? So um, we're trying to reconcile this between transit app and Flamingo fares. So the way that we, that we build in the fares is the whole route becomes that fare. Um, and if we split the route so that, you know, not that people get off the trolley at all, but that, that in, our, in the back end system, then when you go on transit app, it looks like two separate routes. And so it looks like you have to transfer. So in order to avoid that confusion, we left the route whole for the moment um, and asked operations to not charge people between the pier and Grand Central. Um, and the city of St. Petersburg has been working with them to take that 50, even the 50 cent zone and just make that a fare free zone all the way to Grand Central. Um, and so, no, you shouldn't have been charged, right. um, but uh, we are working on both uh, a, a short-term operational issue and then a longer-term technology yeah. issue. Okay. Um, but we d are aware of the issue. And okay, good. We're working because to solve it, yes. Someone that was a little cagey could just get on at the pier and not get off of Grand Central <coughs> and get out to the beach for it, essentially. But well, it happened before, so it'll happen. You know, well, yeah, I mean, it's okay. I'm, you know, <clears throat> hypothetical. But thank you. Thank you for working on it.
And uh, if I might, I just want to, I, I don't know that Michael quite understood the question that okay. uh, Commissioner Schulman had asked. Um, and this is not a Life 360 kind of application where you can see where people are. Um, and we do that deliberately so that there is a level of privacy mm -hmm. for how people travel. What we can see in the back end is how people transfer and sort of the general numbers, mm -hmm. but those are not assigned to specific people. And so um, we will not be tracking your children and we will not be tracking any of our riders individually. So you will still need to have Life360 or no. some other app on their phone to know where they are. Yeah, I was, um, thank you for the, the clarification. I was really um, thinking more of looking in one's own history um, as far as um, payments and things like that, uh, using the history to kind of judge, but. Well, if they're on the PCS, if they're on a, on a PCS institution uh, card, um, they will not have any payment to look at anyway. Right, and that, that, that's, that's what I was saying though, is that at some point, um, also using Flamingo Fair's platform, instead of having multiple different ways of tracking people when they get on the bus, right. they all just use their Flamingo Fair's card, which would indicate a potentially a no fair history, but um, still scanning that card so it builds into your own personal history. You know what I'm saying? So, uh, so if I'm a student, I use my Flamingo Fair's, I use my phone or car, mm -hmm. Flamingo Fair's card to log on, it shows a zero fare, but that gets logged in as the history. It doesn't show you every time that you get on. It, it just shows you when you've, when you've paid. Okay, so, the, um, and I, I haven't gone, I was trying to, right. unfortunately trying to open the app and it wasn't letting me do it. So, okay. um, so the, the history is just a balance? <laughs> or? A balance history as opposed to, I've tapped right. this many times today or I've tapped, or I tapped at this location or anything like wouldn't you wouldn't be able to see that you'd just be able to see your balance okay I'll have to think about how that yeah no, how now I feel uh, about that. there is another side of the question is once the students leave the PCS system they would be able to port their account to a family account or to a personal account and so you wouldn't have to give up your card or, or your account to do that so you could also get a new one as well okay I, I would just think even as a normal user like much like Vince was stating with, with the, the fare that wasn't charged the right amount is being able to look at my own transit history um, when it comes just from you know reconciling my own bill you know as opposed to just uh, so you'd be able to see the the deduction but you wouldn't be able to see the location and then the deduction has a date or just a or, or does it have a timestamp also no, I, 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 just yeah, this is, yeah. We'll, it's just we'll, Tuesday. It does right. show, like, when you've ridden, like, a yeah. time and day. Right. Okay, so that, that's, yeah. right, so, I mean, that, that is, you know, time and date, here's the, tr you know, that is, that is, that is information, of, right. and that's not the, the stop, and then you yeah, clearly you don't say know where, where you they are. are. Yeah. And I'm also saying that this is, right, Flamingo Fairs was a great platform to start and then grow future use. So I realize some of this might not be built in and might not be where we're headed at this moment, but you know, I'd like us all to be thinking about how to integrate more of these services so that it becomes a more ubiquitous platform for our, our community um, in all the different ways that we're trying to get people on, on the bus. Right, that's it. So, but I appreciate the clarification. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And um, Commissioner Miller? Chair, Chair Cox, I just wanna um, just make a, uh, one comment that as you, as you saw, um, the Flamingo program has done very well uh, at PSTA. And maybe, maybe as you saw um, at these, some of the other communities, maybe not as well. It's going okay, I think. A number of the uh, smaller counties um, that were on board in the very beginning have, have decided not to continue to participate mainly because they added Flamingo as a separate product um, to their, to whatever fair systems they already had. Um, and it was only PSDA that decided basically we're gonna go cold turkey. Like we're gonna completely transition uh, from the old fare box system we had, we had for a long time to Flamingo. And that is, 
been the real reason for the success. And hats off to Michael and Al and Cassandra and the others in our operations for making that a success. We, we were able to, we were in a kind of unique position for that because of our transportation disadvantaged bus pass program that we have. That we have, we had before the pandemic, 5,000 people a, a month that were getting a pass from us, a magnetic stripe pass that now we gave them all flamingo cards on July 1. Uh, so that that has what is result that that's why our numbers are so great is so many of our rider our regular riders have flamingo cards. Um, moving forward to the question of uh, Commissioner Schulman about how how to get even more and more people on. I, again, the current goal that we've sort of established for ourselves is how can we finally wean ourselves completely away from the mag stripes. Uh, we still have thousands of customers every day that get on the bus and they want a day pass and they put $5 into the machine, $5 in cash, and then a mag stripe pops out of the machine, PSDA uh, card. So we're, we're strategizing on how we, can, how we can help those people, keep those people riding the bus and get them onto Flamingo uh, through marketing and, and other methods. I think, as Michael explained, like the next big step in this, and I think the whole world is kind of seeing how this is going to take off in the United States, is this contactless payment. Is, is the concept going to take off where everybody has Apple Pay or um, Google Wallet or whatever, and they can just tap your phone? You don't, you don't have to worry about getting a card or the app or anything like that. You just have Visa or a bank card, and then you can just do your proximity. Supposedly that's going to come this summer, and we'll see. I was in uh, New York City over Christmas, and, and they have just launched it in New York City subway in a pilot way, and it worked one time, and it didn't work another time, so I don't know if it was probably a user error, but um, uh, we'll just have to see. I think that that's a game changer for the future, is if, if we kind of get rid of all of our fair media and just use... Visa and bank cards that we all have in our wallets anyway, mm -hmm. then that might be a major, major change down the road. So, if I may, um, yeah. how does that work from a fair capping perspective, right? So, if we're using, if I'm using, you know, Google Pay, um, and I'm using it regularly, does it still know to cap the rate when it? It does. And how the heck would it do that? Right, so if you have more than one card in your in your Google Pay or Apple Pay, and you switch cards, then it won't recognize the the SIM, right? What it recognizes is the card. So if you say, I always use my uh, Visa debit card for my transit, it will recognize that card number and and do the, the fair capping for you. But if you switch and you say, oh, you know, I'm going to use my Discover <coughs> now, then then it won't. It won't recognize that this morning you used your visa and then the afternoon you used your discover. So, uh, per, 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 yeah. Currently, I don't, I don't believe fair capping will function through the open payment system the way it's configured currently. Um, just, just to let you know. Um, okay. So, um, the that I, I can see where the open payment system definitely works for our. Infrequent tourist travelers, they're here, they don't need to download a whole lot of app, they just need to be able to get on and get, get back off the bus when, as they need. Um, is, are we working on building in a contactless payment through the phone, through Flamingo? Like, right? Uh, yes, yeah. we're, we're working on a, the new, what's it called, Michael? It's near field? Uh, yeah, the NFC, near field communication. The NFC, yes. Yeah. So besides besides open payments and accepting um, fare through, say, Apple Pay, for example, um, they're also working on a feature of the app where you can just read your Flamingo card through through the NFC proximity too, um, as well. So that that's that should be implemented soon um, before open payments. Okay, and that's so there still is an, an easy way for people to be able to use that convenience while still maintaining the 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 features of fair capping and family rides and all those other sorts of things. Right. Okay. Uh, can branch up, um, Commissioner Miller? 
It looks like the Pasco and Sarasota dropped out of the, the Flamingo Cup. We just got the letter E last night from Pasco. Okay. That they are the last one to uh, decline. And like I said, it was it's it's generally because they they didn't get they, they they offered Flamingo to their customers, but their customers were already using passes and they didn't really do any kind of promotion or anything to switch them over to Flamingo. Uh -huh. So they, they didn't feel like they were seeing much benefit from it. There's a possibility then that down the road especially with our great leadership of how everyone in Pinellas is going to Flamingo, um, maybe they'll change their mind. Yeah, because um, that, I mean, to Pasco is a pretty decent market, I would think. PSTA linking up with, you know, up with Tarpon there to yeah. picking up the Pasco um, transit system. So they pay separately when they get on the Pasco bus now, is that correct? I yeah. guess so, yeah. I mean, we just got the letter yesterday. They, they have readers on all of their all of their buses uh, paid for by heart. Um, huh. And uh, I don't know if they're working or if they turned them off or uh, we'll have to find okay, out. Yeah, just we'll, find, we'll, just we'll, find we'll, out. Because yeah. I think it's important um, that um, we have that partnership um, with Pasco, yeah. more, more so than Manatee. And um, well, Hillsboro is naturally an important part, partnership too, but we have service over there. Okay, that's all. Um, any other comments, questions? All right, let's move on then to uh, the monthly financial statement. And Julie Lupus will walk us through that, and she's here in person. Julie? Yes, I'm here in person. Good to see you. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. I'm Julie Lupus, Director of Accounting. For the month of November, we finished $9.5 million favorable to budget due to earlier than expected and budgeted receipt of tax revenue. It's something that happens yearly. On the expense side, we came out at 282,000 favorable to budget, $200,000 attributed to purchase transportation being under budget. The effects of COVID have been and still are a factor in the favorable variance, as is the effect that budgeting for our new providers has had. The remainder of the favorable variance is associated with salaries and advertising savings. Turning to your next page, for November year to date, we finished with a net surplus of 15.5 million and was 9.9 .9 million favorable to budget. Year to date, the favorable expense variance is helping to carry the surplus with salaries under budget, 295,000, and purchase transportation services under budget, 500,000. That's the high level look at the November financials. Does anyone have any questions? Sounds good to me. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, so, um, you know, we're, we're under budget on, on salaries, Is, are we, are, are those positions that are open and we're seeking or we do we do have a number of open positions but that is largely i think because starting almost uh, at the beginning of the fiscal year we due to the delta variant reducing the number of bus operators that we can reliably have out there to provide the service we reduced the service level by about six percent and we have been not saving that money uh, for the first couple months of the fiscal year. We're going to go, the plan right now, because we've been on a hiring spree, is to go back to full service in February. Uh, so that savings will, if our budget is correct, is act, you know, uh, go, we'll away go back to that. normal. But yeah, for the first, I think that's most of what the $200,000, the $300,000 in savings so far in salaries is. Okay, okay thank you. All right, and again, okay, thank, thank you, you so much, Julie. Bad news uh, to Julie on our financial, the customer service department is watching this and they are going to credit your Flamingo account, Vince. Um, oh boy. For the two, uh, for the <laughs> two bucks, you're rich. I'm back up to $49.50 on that. <laughs> yes. okay, thank you. Thank you, customer service. And um, PSDA contracts, Debbie, would you like to? Lead us through this. <clears throat> Good morning. Certainly. 
Yeah, good morning. Um, this is our normal quarterly report. I don't think that there's anything of noteworthiness in it, but I would open up for any questions. Any questions? Nope. Oh, well, that was short. Sweet. Thanks, Thank Deb. You. Thank you, Deb. And Brad, ridership. Do you have anything to highlight for ridership? We got two months worth of uh, since we didn't have a December uh, committee meeting, um, and um, ridership was down in November. And <coughs> I had heard that nationwide transit ridership has moved down the last quarter of the year due to coronavirus, obviously. Um, but we had a really strong December month, so. Uh, so, more to come, I don't know. Any December comments? ridership was, uh, was up on most of our routes. Um, <coughs> so we'll just have to see what happens in 2022. Okay, I, I have a comment or question here that we've seen a lot of complaints on our access uh, transit here up 270 percent and 373 percent in December for complaints is that due to what reason we have different opinions about exactly what is the call what is the cause of that um, that we are looking into um, Obviously, there's been a transition to a new uh, provider operator. D in December, the number spiked up because uh, we launched um, our mm -hmm. uh, our new software. As you know, there they have been uh, getting increased number of complaints about lateness and on-time performance that we are making our way through. And making improvements, I think I think they're much better now that we're into January than they were in the first couple of weeks in December. Um, but yeah, um, there is some thought that we're seeing an increased number just because we have lots of different vendors providing rides now, and maybe we're. I'm not sure about that. I'm not sure if that's accurate or not. Whether or not we're double counting the same complaint, I'm not sure. But uh, I mean, I I would think from what I've learned that a lot of this emanates from the new software that we're using that doesn't seem to be yes. too compatible with the provider of the service. And um, so I sure hope that we're working on, on that. I think it's very important because what it does when we get these complaints, not only are we, um, it doesn't look good for TSDA, number one. And then number two, well actually more important, the customer's time that they have to take to make phone calls, and, and I've heard from drivers, I know drivers that drive for uh, access, and they say they'll be in the vehicle trying to call here, and they just can't get through. Um, I heard that from a driver the other day. Oh. But all, all that being said, I, I really think it's very important that we get a fix on this in the SSAC as soon as we can because it, it's money is what it boils down to. You know, it costs us money you know, for people having to take the right. time to call, having to tie up our operators and so on and so forth. So I, I'd appreciate um, that we get something going on that. And that's all I have to say on that. All right, does any other committee member have any business before we close here? Mr. Shulman? <laughs> Let's wait for him to get back. No, we'll go ahead and adjourn. <clears throat> Thank you. Our next meeting is February 18th at 9 a.m. It's a Friday meeting, y'all. Right? It is. Huh? Fish yeah. Friday. <laughs> adjourn. <laughs> February 18th is a Friday? Yep. It yep. is, because I'll be in Tallahassee um, on our the Wednesday. You know? I was, I was looking for you, Mr. Shulman, but... Um, What's that? I was looking for you to say anything, but we're done. Don't worry, I got a whole uh, hour and a half to explain. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm just getting warmed up. Right. The number, of, the, the number of the complaints I 